Good morning and welcome uh, to our service this morning. For those of you at home, this is a reaffirmation Sunday and uh, Greg will be reading some of the names this morning uh, towards the middle of the service. For those of you who are here whose names will be read, we will be remaining in seats, but please respond verbally to the litany that's there. Um, when the service ends and the postlude is prayed, is played, excuse me, we'll be remaining in our seats until that's completed and then we can exit using the aisle closest to you and then right out the front doors where you can meet and speak with one another there. Thank you. Good morning. Yes, once again, welcome to the 20th Sunday after Pentecost, which, as Nancy said, is also reaffirmation day for us here at the church. We begin by clearing our hearts and minds as we do our call to worship together. The world tells us we need to be part of something big and bold. We belong to God. The world tells us to put our hope in wealth and success. We put our faith and trust in Jesus. The world tells us to seek our own gain and satisfaction. We seek joy in the Spirit of God. Come, let us worship God who leads us away from the ways of the world. Let us follow and live into the way of Christ Jesus our Lord. Amen. Our opening hymn is Eternal God Whose Power Upholds. We know, despite our sincere efforts to live in God's way, that all too easily we slip off of the path of the kingdom. Trusting that God will answer our prayers and forgive us, let us confess, confess our sins as we pray together. Almighty God, we confess that our point of view is often narrow. We see only what is in front of us, the easy way, or the best way for ourselves, and we do not see how our actions may harm others. Forgive us for our short-sightedness. 
open our minds to see that what makes things easy for us may make things much more difficult for others. Help us to see how our actions may harm others and creation and ultimately you. Transform our lives so that we will help and serve others rather than only ourselves. In the name of Christ who calls us into repentance, forgiveness and restoration, we pray, amen. Hear the good news. The one who created goodness and beauty is also the one who shows no partiality, but offers grace and peace to all. God has heard our prayers and done the very thing we asked, forgiven us, healed us, restored us. Thanks be to God. Amen. Congregation, what do you believe? I believe in God, the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, and in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Ghost, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, dead and buried. He descended into hell. The third day he rose again from the dead. He ascended into heaven and sitteth on the right hand of God, the Father Almighty. From thence he shall come to judge the quick and the dead. I believe in the Holy Ghost, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. Good morning, boys and girls. I feel like I'm a TV personality with all the kids out there. Okay, so um, I found this thank you card that I have, and I like to buy thank you cards that are empty inside because then I can thank for anything, right? So what are things we're thankful for? Sometimes. A person has a tummy ache and somebody makes soup for them. And so they send a thank you card. Sometimes a friend gives you a gift. So you're thankful and you can write that down. There's so many things to be thankful for. And there's so many ways to thank, right? You can bake cookies. Um, you can uh, spend time with a friend. You can make that soup for someone who's sick. So there are many ways to say thank you. This reminds me of uh, the story we're going to hear today. The Apostle Paul, who likes to write story, he likes to write letters, and he writes lots of letters. But in today's story, the city he was speaking to, uh, writing to, he specifically loved them, and he wrote thank you letters. And he starts out by saying that he's thankful for them and for what they're doing and what were they doing. They were doing the things of God. They were doing what Jesus Christ modeled. So uh, Paul was thanking them to continue to be imitators of Jesus. And how do you imitate Jesus? You imitate Jesus by this word that a lot of people saw today. Okay, I didn't just wear it because I thought it was cool. Love. Jesus says to love others and let others imitate that in you. So every time I think of saying thank you every morning when I wake up, every night when I go to bed, I think of the thank you letter that Paul wrote, but I also think of the love that God wants me to share with others. Let us pray. God, there's so many things to be thankful for. We're thankful for family and friends and food and, and our homes and we're just thankful. But most of all, we're thankful that Jesus Christ came into this world to love us and to save us. In his name we thank you. Amen. So we have one scripture lesson today. It's not in your bulletin. It's in the words up here, and I just happened to find an NRSV version, so it might be a little different than what you're seeing there or seeing at home. 
but it's the first letter of Paul to the Thessalonians. It's the entire chapter. Paul, Silvanus, and Timothy. To the church of the Thessalonians, in God the Father and the Lord Jesus Christ, grace to you and peace. We always give thanks to God for all of you and mention you in our prayers constantly, remembering before our God and Father your work of faith and labor of love and steadfastness of hope in our Lord Jesus Christ. For we know, brothers and sisters, beloved by God, that he has chosen you because our message of the gospel came to you not in word only, but also in power and in the Holy Spirit and with full conviction, just as you know what kind of persons we prove to be among you for your sake. And you became imitators of us and of the Lord, for in spite of persecution, you received the word with joy inspired by the Holy Spirit, so that you became an example to all the believers in Macedonia and in Achaia. For the word of the Lord has sounded forth from you, not only in Macedonia and Achaia, but in every place your faith in God has become known, so that we have no need to speak about it. For the people of those regions report about us what kind of welcome we had among you and how you turned to God from idols, to serving a living and true God, and to wait for his Son from heaven, whom he raised from the dead, Jesus who rescues us from the wrath that is coming. Here ends the reading. So make a difference. I'll be preaching from that chapter we just heard. Let us pray. Lord, let the fruit of my lips be pleasing to you. And let your glory, the Holy Spirit, fill this place. Amen. So I don't need to tell you that we are all living in blurred lines today. You know, school used to be it used to have a start and a stop date, right? And when school ends, or when school ended, for some of us who were teachers, and I know there's some educators here, I was one myself, we sort of miss being involved in that part of educating America with so much outside influence and pressure to do more. I know things would be very different if this was my classroom, that's what we tend to say. We want our kids, we want our grandkids to be successful, yet other powers and influences get in the way. I read a magazine article about the right way to learn, about being successful. It said, we no longer want to be successful because that's not ambitious enough. Now we want to be the best. The article went on to mention eight successful things that people do that make them great. And I was curious. I wanted to know if I was on the right track to victory. So I'll share about four of them with you. The first one, the first measurement of success is to be uncomfortable. You have to not just be good. You have to be stretched to the edge of your ability. Apparently, that's how the brain works. The second thing is stop reading and start doing. Many of us are good at reading on how to be good, but we don't necessarily get to a chance to make that up and make the changes. It looks great on paper. You have to be the best at doing, not at reading, the article says. The closer you practice to the real thing, the faster you learn. The third one, commit to the long term if you want to be successful. Commitment makes a difference when you know how long you can handle something. And the last one I'll share is find a role model. Watching the best people at work is one of the most powerful things you can do. It motivates and inspires you to be the best, study the best, and be the best. I love this because I'm on my way to being successful. But I didn't have to read this article. I really just needed 
needed to and need to keep reading the Bible. I need to be uncomfortable at times. I need not to just read the Bible, but also to live it. I need to commit to the long term, and I also need to find a role model. This Bible is full of role models. Today we're talking about the Apostle Paul and what a role model he was. He, an, evangelist, an evangelist once said about him, he said, whenever the Apostle Paul visited a city, the residents started a riot. When I visit one, they serve tea. See, Paul began his career as an enemy of Christianity, and yet he became its greatest leader. After Jesus, he's the most famous person in the New Testament. He was actively committed to the cause, and he was passionate about his thoughts of God. Paul went from murderer to missionary. He took the good news of Jesus to the world. He traveled moving from city to city, preaching to the Jews and to the Gentiles. What made Paul successful? Paul was chased out of towns when angry mobs took, took offense at what he was saying and accusing him of all the trouble he's causing around the world. See, the trouble was that everywhere that Paul went, a new church came to life, making Romans and Jews jealous. In Thessalonica, Paul writes this love letter. This letter is probably one of the, his earliest writings. It was written maybe about 20 years after Jesus, after the death, after the resurrection. When Paul lived with the Thessalonians, he was gentle and loving. And when he was not with them, he wrote letters and he poured his love all over the letters for them. He praised them for their strength and he fussed over reports of weaknesses, but he always thanked them for their spiritual progress. The letter we read today is from a successful leader who reveals his gratitude, his disappointment, his joy of a church he cannot stop thinking about. Paul was successful because he not only made an impression on the people, but the people made an impression on him. So let's look a little further into the Thessalonians passage. When Paul wrote this letter to this church community, he, he usually, when he writes a letter, he usually assesses like the state of the church, the state of Christianity in that time and that place. Like, for example, in Galatia, the congregation had compromised the gospel for legalism. They confused Jesus Christ with moral and ritual observance. Paul spoke to them bluntly and he told them that they were turning uh, wine into water. And that's not how things go. And to the people in Corinth, however, the, the people thought faith in Christ meant that they needed to have no morals. You just have faith. He told them, he told them, if I can find that page, He told them that that was a disgrace. Now for the Christians in Thessalonica, Paul found them to be good role models. If you want to be a true church, then follow the passage that you heard today. Because Thessalonica was like the teacher's pet of Asia Minor. Paul offered suggestions and no major criticisms. Paul points out three reasons why they are good role models for Christian faith and practice and for Christian faith and practice and why he states in in verse 220 which we didn't read today indeed you are our glory and joy so the first reason he gives why they're good role models they're good role models because they had deep conviction scripture says what does that mean paul reminded the church that the gospel comes not only in the word but in the power of the holy spirit the word has to be so powerful to you that you stop reading and you start living the Bible. In verses 4 and 5, Paul tells them, For we know, brothers and sisters, loved by God, that he has chosen you, because our gospel came to you not simply with words, but also with power, with the Holy Spirit and deep conviction. See, conviction is believing. When Paul left the church at Thessalonia, he was happy to hear reports that the church was still filled with the Spirit living out the gospel. 
See, people today overlook the fact that the church is not effective when the pastor is in the congregation, but rather what happens after the pastor leaves. The Spirit is what carries us and gives us life. As we live this risen Christ, people notice. R.C. Sproul wrote once about a professional golfer, Jack Nicklaus. He was playing a tournament and, uh, with President Gerald Ford and the preacher, Billy Graham. After they played, another golfer asked what it was like playing with the president and Billy Graham. And the golfer was upset and he said, I don't need Billy Graham stuffing religion down my throat. The golfer responded, was Billy a little rough on you out there? And Jack said, no, he didn't even mention religion. Billy Graham apparently has said nothing about God, about Jesus, or about religion. Yet the golfer felt threatened that Billy was trying to ram religion down his throat. Because you see, when we walk with full conviction of who we are, the Holy Spirit does all the work. I believe this. People are not reading the Bible, but they're reading you and me. So walk with deep conviction as the Thessalonians did. The second reason these people, uh, they were Paul's glory and joy was because they left the life they had of serving idols, Scripture says, and started serving God exclusively. We tend to think of idolatry as something that happened way back, right? We're building of big statues. But we have modern day things we cannot live without. And I'm not going to mention them, but you know them. For the Thessalonians, Paul heard they turned away and served God. The end of verse 9, he states, they tell how you turned to God from idols to serve the living and true God. They thanked God every day for that their lives were turned and they repented. We need to turn away from things that keep us from a relationship with God. I say it all the time. Anything that comes between me and this here, that's an idol. D.L. Moody the D.L. Moody story says that a preacher spoke to a young girl outside the church after evening service one day, and he was counting her. And she said she was a Christian and wanted to follow Christ, but she wanted to be famous, too. She wanted to pursue that career in New York and told the pastor, after I have made it in the theater, I will follow Christ completely. The pastor took a key out of his pocket, and he started scratching the mailbox. And he told her, this is what God will let you do. God will let you scratch the surface of success. He will let you get close enough to the top to know what it is, but he will never let you have it because he will never let one of his children have anything rather than himself. Thess Thessalonians knew not to flirt with anything that got in the way between God and their beliefs. And the third reason, there's deep conviction, the first, there's leaving the life you had, and the final one is in spite of persecution. Scripture says they welcomed the message. Verse 6 says you became imitators of us and of the Lord, for you welcomed the message in the midst of severe suffering with the joy given by the Holy Spirit. See, these people knew that accepting Jesus into their lives would mean shining a light on them, which provoked resentment by others. Jesus knew about this new radical ministry. We know what it means to follow Jesus. Some people just won't like it. We have family members who refuse to come to church because of those hypocrites. When Jesus was born, it was a massive slaughter of infants. All the way up to the day of Barabbas, the day Barabbas was released instead of Jesus, and up on that cross, there has always been resentment toward Christ. The Thessalonians knew the closer they were to Christ, the more they would get into trouble with the authorities. Yet, with the help of the Holy Spirit, they lived their lives in joy in spite of their difficulties. 
As a third century man was anticipating death, he penned these last words to a friend. He says, it's a bad world, an incredibly bad world. But I have discovered in the midst of it a quiet and holy people who have learned a great secret. They have found a joy with a thousand times better than any pleasure of our sinful life. They're despised and persecuted, but they care not. They're masters of their souls. They have overcome the world. These people are the Christians, and I am one of them. See, Christians, Paul complimented the Thessalonians for having deep conviction, for turning from living in the past with their idols, and for welcoming the message of Christ despite the persecution. They were making a difference in their town by living the way Jesus did every day. To be successful, we all have to do, all we have to do is make a difference. We already make a difference. We've made a difference by coming here today. We make a difference if we believe and overcome our own worldly obstacles. And I want to talk to the reaffirmation people that are here today and at home. Keep a deep conviction. Keep believing. Read the word and keep living it. Live it out until Jesus says otherwise. Start serving God exclusively. The TV, the internet, the phone, the social media, that's all going to look bigger than God, at least for the rest of this year. Turn away from what gets between you and Scripture. Keep thanking God for showing you the way. And become imitators in the midst of suffering. There are health issues. There's politics world issues, family problems. Remember that the closer you get to Christ, the more uncomfortable people are going to get. But do it anyway. Don't just be successful. Be the best. Use Jesus Christ as your role model and invite the Holy Spirit to lead you. Let us pray. Lord, we wake up thankful every day. We may not say it. We may not write a letter like Paul did. But Lord, our hearts show, our hearts show love to ourselves and love to others. So let us begin each new day with finding a way to be imitators of Christ and to follow you each of our days. Amen. Following that sermon, great is thy faithfulness.
We respond with our tithes and offerings and offering of ourselves in, in prayer, time, talent, treasures. For those of you who are in here, the plate stays in one spot. So as you leave by the middle door, uh, there is an offering plate there. And for those at home, we do have online giving. God has shown us the meaning of generosity and the beautiful diversity of creation and the over, overflowing love of Jesus Christ and in the never-ending gift of the Holy Spirit, God has blessed us abundantly and called us to be a community that blesses others through the sharing of our love, our talents, and our material possessions. Let us rejoice now in what we have been given and in, and in what is ours to give an offering from a distance and from those here today, let us pray over the gifts. Thank you, God, for the generosity that enables us to share. We are rich in many things. Help us to empty ourselves of pretense, even as we pour out gifts of gratitude. We dedicate our offerings and ourselves to shaping the community you intend in the spirit of Christ. Amen. As we prepare for a recommitment we will be praying together just want you to think of the people who have been named on the list to name a few bill linda scott mary Kay, and ben uh rosalina who's a co-worker of mine um, her mother fell and was about all night on the floor and her daughter found her the next morning um another person also tamara she found out she's suffering from a lot of headaches and she found out that there's something in there they have to go in and check it. Um, we're, we have thankful hearts. We have those suffering from depression, the anxiety over rising cases that we keep hearing about. Pray for the ad hoc team. You know, you got a little warmth today. You got a little air flowing through. Pray for the ad hoc team, decisions that have to be made. And today we are praying for our sister church, United Reformed, uh, Reverend Paul Jansen, a good friend of mine, I asked him this morning, what do you want me to pray for? What, what are we going to pray? And he said they have their virtual crop walk today. And that Pastor Paul walks around the Somerville Greenway live on Facebook at 2 p.m. So pray on these things as we move forward with the service. I turn it over to you. celebrating Reaffirmation Sunday as we normally do traditionally in this church. We announce the five year and in increments of five anniversaries. So every five years, everybody gets to reaffirm. Five years ago, on 2015, Daniel Formato joined this church and Peter Skunda asked to be remembered. Ten years ago, in 2010, 
Chris Pramato joined the church, and Brett DeBorrow and Ryan Quick asked to be remembered at this time. Fifteen years ago, Rebecca Twitek joined the church, and Laura Feynman Wong asked to be remembered. And Courtney Cotton also asked to be remembered. Twenty years ago, in the year 2000, Lori Voorhees joined the church, and David Gwynn joined the church, and Frank Benziel asked to be remembered. Twenty-five years ago, Ken Skillman and Nancy Skillman joined this church, and Tom DeBoro and Janet DeBoro asked to be remembered, and Jim Quick and Jenny Quick asked to be remembered. Thirty years ago, Bob Collins, Janet Collins, Joe String, and Doreen String asked to be remembered. Thirty-five years ago, 1985, Richard Gerstner and Laura Gerstner joined this church. Fifty-five years ago, in 1965, Charles Algier asked to be remembered. And sixty years ago, 1960, Hugo Paul Hemus joined this church. And the flowers today are given in her honor and will be handed to her at the church outside. Now, all those who kindly join me in the litany of remembrance. To you, in celebration of your relationship with the Church of Christ at Clover Hill, we affirm your desire to be part of this household of faith. Do you promise again before God and these witnesses to live faithfully in response to the means of grace, especially the hearing of the word and the use of the sacrament? Do you pledge yourself again to walking in the spirit of Christian love and fellowship with this congregation? Are you willing to offer faithfully and joyfully service of God, your prayers and gifts, and to seek always the things which make for peace and unity in the Church of Jesus Christ. Though the congregation witnesses to these vows, please respond. These, these your brothers and sisters in Christ have promised today to renew their efforts to fulfill their vows to you as a community of the faithful and ultimately to the Lord and ours. What do you offer them? We offer ourselves as fellow pilgrims in life. We will walk with you. We will work with you. We will learn from you. We will teach you. Together we will be the church of Jesus Christ of Clover Hill. We have promised to do things. We have promised to be a church family. The only, only way we will be able to do that is with the help of God. Let us seek that help. Let us pray. Heavenly and Father, Father in your wisdom, wisdom you have chosen, chosen to reveal your nature to the divine and human institution called the church. In your, in your mercy, mercy, you have allowed your church to survive countless blunders, errors, and sins, and have delivered it intact to our generation. By your grace, you have called us to be your church. Make us worthy. Make us appreciative. Make us holy. Bless these, your children, who renew their vows, kindle within them the fire of your spirit, so that they might lead the rest of us to new experiences of faith in our lives. We ask it in Christ's name, even as we pray his prayer. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our debts, as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory forever. Amen. And bless you all. Our closing hymn is, Lord, when I came into this life,
receive the benediction. Go forth now, filled with God's grace. Cradle others in God's peace. Go forth now with the words that can transform the world. Go to speak for those who have not heard. Go forth now, taking the light of God into the world. Go into every shadowed corner with hope lighting the way. May the triune God bless you, Creator, Son, and Holy Ghost, both now and forevermore. Amen.